Okay, Maggie, take it away. Great. Okay. Um, can everyone hear me? Can you hear me? me? Yes. Okay. Awesome. All right. Um, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about Google Scholar versus library resources. Like Amy said, uh, my name is Maggie Murphy. I'm a first year instruction librarian. I'm also the liaison to the philosophy and religious studies departments and the college writing program, which is English 101 and English 102. Um, today, I just wanted to get a sense of who is here because I'm going to do some live demos of both the library resources and Google Scholar. And I have some questions uh, about your research interests and what resources you use for research. So if you wanted to visit this link, um, if you can quickly and fill out the form, that will help me get a sense of, uh, of who's here and what you already know and what you want to know. Um, so we'll take a couple of minutes uh, for people to fill that in. I'll wait until I have like three responses because I think there are only three people <laughs> who are not me and Amy here. And I also apologize if I am fumbling at all because this is my first time using WebEx. Okay, got some responses. Let's see, can I drag this over here? Great, okay. Um, so for those of us who have shared, uh, we have some people who use WorldCat Discovery, multidisciplinary subject databases, Google Scholar. Um, you have not or are not sure if you've set up Google Scholar alerts. Uh, yes and no to Google Scholar author profile and no to the library link. So that is great because one of the most useful things I'm going to show you today is the Google Scholar library link. Okay, so getting back to the presentation. Um, so there are really two kind of overall concepts I want you to keep in mind when we're talking about um, doing research and that is discovery, which is finding out about the existence of sources through searching or browsing and access, which is actually getting the full text of the source. Um, and they're kind of two separate issues. Um, so when we're talking about discovery, the item that you are finding is really like a citation, an abstract, a record, you know, evidence that a source exists. Um, and for access, it's actually the hard copy or a PDF or HTML text of the item, you know, the full text of the item. Um, so for a quick library resources overview, um, and I say everything's free with your Spartan ID and freeze in quotation marks because these things actually aren't free, they are just paid for um, using our funds for the library. Um, so these are actually, you know, high quality expensive resources that you have access to because of your affiliation with the library. So um, I'm going to distinguish between resources and then our databases, because our resources are more than our article databases. We have books, journals, newspapers, magazines, government documents, multimedia, data, statistics. Um, we also have our curated research and citation guides made by our librarians, um, and I'll point those out. We also have support for other tools for researchers like Zotero and EndNote. Um, and I'm pointing this out because there's sort of a parallel to some features to Google Scholar that I'll point out. And then one of our uh, most important resources is the people that work here, our librarians, archivists, digital media specialists, et cetera. Um, so when we're talking about our resources, again, these are paid subscriptions and they're governed by vendor contracts. So there's some um, support and accountability with the people that provide these resources. And again, access is a three-year affiliation with UNCG. 
um, to now talk specifically about our databases, which is more parallel to the Google Scholar um, example. We have hundreds of databases for article searching. Um, these generally fall into multidisciplinary databases, so databases where you can find research from more than one discipline, and these are your academic search complete, your ProQuest research library, um, and then the subject databases, which will be dependent on your area of interest, um, so things like the MLA International Bibliography, um, ERIC, which is educational resources, uh, we've got all kinds of subject databases. And you can find these through the databases, I said A through Z, but it actually just says databases on the library website, I'll show you that in a second. And then again, we have curated resources on our research guides by subject. Um, so every discipline has a subject librarian who has identified the most important resources, including databases for each subject. Um, and our library databases don't just include article databases. We have reference or encyclopedia databases, statistics, databases of musical scores, um, market and industry data, images, streaming video. Um, so whereas Google Scholar is a database uh, of only scholarly research in the form of articles and other formats. Um, our databases, we have a lot of article databases, but we also have these other additional kinds of databases. Um, so to go through some quick pros and cons uh, between our library databases, um, pros, uh, you can search for articles from both popular and scholarly sources in a lot of our article databases. You can also limit them to just one or the other. Um, the content in the databases, again, these are subscription resources. They're organized by experts, cataloged. Um, the metadata is indexed so that you can uh, find information by different categories. Um, the metadata is just the information about the articles. Um, and when I say index, I mean you can find it by title, you can find it by the title of the journal, you can find it by the text of the abstract. There's all these different categories where you can find information from. Using most of the databases, it's easy to identify which articles in your results are from peer-reviewed sources. Using that metadata or data about data, we can isolate that out. And you can also limit your search to show you what you have full text access to. Because um, thinking back to what I said about discovery and access, you're going to discover the existence of a lot of articles in some of these databases. There will be records or abstracts or citations, but we might not have access to them. So you can isolate your search to show you what you do have access to, and that's a nice feature of some of these databases if you're not doing an exhaustive search, if you only want to know what you can read right now. Some cons, um, there's no good single point for discovery of articles uh, using these databases. The multidisciplinary databases have sort of a wide reach, um, a good representation of a lot of different disciplines. The subject databases are more uh, focused on particular disciplines, but um, every database package is kind of like a cable package, um, and just like cable packages, you know, if you get one package, you might have HBO, but you don't have Showtime. Um, a good research practice is to duplicate your search in multiple points of discovery, because then you will sort of get the full range of articles. Um, because these databases are made by a bunch of different companies, there's different interfaces, which is the actual website that you search, um, and every interface works a little bit differently, looks a little bit different. And then one of the biggest cons of databases for new users, and even librarians, is that they have to be searched using structured keywords. Um, Boolean operators, which are, are linking words like and, or, and not, and controlled vocabulary, which are um, basically like hashtags, but they are established by the catalogers. So if you're looking for information on climate change, um, there will be a single hashtag for all of the articles, regardless of whether they use the term uh, carbon pollution or uh, global warming, there'll be a single controlled term for all of those articles that is applied. But you have to know what that term is and it will vary by database. So I'm going to quickly, uh, let's see, head over to the library website 
to show you um, some of these things. So the first thing I want to point out is this red search box here. Um, and the all search box is really sort of like a blunt object in terms of searching. It's searching through our holdings here, the books that we have access to, the journals we have access to, the databases we subscribe to, um, but we find it kind of easier to use these facet searches. Uh, so you can search just our book catalog, which also includes music and videos, um, just our articles, uh, just our DVDs, etc. Um, but even the article search is still sort of like uh, pretty overwhelming because it's searching through multiple databases all at once. And I'm going to come back to that concept. Um, you can also click on databases. And here you see our top databases. Um, these include both uh, multidisciplinary databases like Academic Search Complete, ProQuest Central, JSTOR, um, and then there are going to be some of our most popular subject databases like Info, uh, Naxos Music Library, uh, CINAHL. Um, you can also uh, find databases, like if you happen to know the name of the database, through this alphabetical list. Um, for example, I mentioned an encyclopedia database. Uh, one of the ones that I like the most is Credo Reference, so I'm scrolling, scrolling, scrolling until I get there. And um, this is a source provided through NC Live, and it's sort of like a credible Wikipedia. Um, so it's uh, pulling from published reference sources, published encyclopedias. Um, and so if your students or you are looking for a reference source that you want to be able to cite um, that is authored by experts instead of crowdsourced, uh, this is a good place to go for that. So that came from the alphabetical list. The other place to look for database suggestions for where you do your searching um, is our research guides by subject. And again, these are made by librarians. Um, and so these are curated resources from the experts in each discipline. So for example, I'll take a look at the philosophy research guide. Um, and so each research guide has a sort of general. And then if there are guides to particular courses within that discipline, they'll be over here. Um, Amy actually made this guide because I took over as the philosophy liaison this year. So if you click on finding articles, here are some philosophy related databases. Philosophers Index is the only philosophy specific database. And then we recommend these multidisciplinary databases as well. Um, in addition to our research guides, we have additional resource guides. And here is where you will find our citation guides um, and guides using our citation, our supported citation management software. Zotero is a, a free um, citation management tool, which means that you can use it to manage the articles that you're reading, um, to collect and annotate citations, and to export bibliographies. Um, we have a webinar that was already completed on Zotero, so that should be on that webinar um, research guide. Uh, so if you're interested in Zotero, you can watch that, or you can get in contact with your subject librarian. Um, and then some additional research guides here. Um, and then lastly, the thing that I want to point out is that, uh, again, you have a subject librarian. Um, you can also get in touch with any librarian who is staffing the reference desk. Um, so this will be dependent on who is there, but you can ask us questions. And this is available um, for multiple hours every week. Right now, the schedule is 8 AM to midnight, Monday through Thursday, 8 to 5 on Friday. 10 to 5 on Saturday, and noon to midnight on Sunday. So multiple hours every week you can get in touch with us. Um, but again, you can email your subject librarian. Uh, so I'm going to go back to the presentation. Um, and now do a Google Scholar overview. So I call this a useful tool in your scholarly arsenal. Um, and so Google Scholar searches scholarly literature only, um, mostly articles, but additionally theses, uh, dissertations, books, abstracts. Um, whereas our library resources, um, our databases gather uh, records from publishers only, Google Scholar actually gathers records about these sources of literature from publishers, but also professional societies and institutional repositories. Um, so these are other sources of articles uh, that our databases may not find. Um, and then uh, 
it also integrates additional features for researchers, which I will show you when I demo it. Um, however, Google Scholar is a free tool. Um, it is available because Google has made it available. Um, there's not very much transparency as to how its um, ranking system works for articles in terms of relevance because Google is a private company with proprietary algorithms. And if Google decides to take Google Scholar down, um, which is always a possibility, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. We don't pay for Google Scholar. Um, additionally, full text access um, to the articles that you find in your searches is limited to those free sources like institutional repositories unless you turn on your library link to UNCG. And I'll show you how to do that. Um, so some pros to Google Scholar, it's free to search for everyone. Um, to search our library databases, you have to be logged into UNCG. So even to see the results, not to access the articles, but to see the results, you already have to be logged in. Google Scholar is a free resource to use for discovery, not for access. Um, sometimes, additionally, because it pulls sources from uh, pulls articles from other sources like institutional repositories and professional organizations. Sometimes it finds access to articles that we don't have access to through UNCG. So you might find a record of an article through a database search, and we don't have a subscription to the journal that supplies us access to that article. But then you can go to Google Scholar, search for the title of the article, and sometimes it'll give you access to that article through another source, like an institutional repository. There are some caveats to that, which I will go over. Um, another pro is that it's a single familiar interface. Uh, searching through Google Scholar is a lot like searching Google, which pretty much everyone is familiar with. And you can also search Google Scholar using natural language, which is the way that we search Google. It's the way that we communicate with each other. Um, so you don't have to think very carefully about the search terms you're using or structure them in a particular way because the Google algorithm automatically looks for synonyms and related phrases, the words that you're using. Um, so if you search for climate change, it'll automatically search for, you know, carbon pollution or global warming or other synonyms um, and our databases don't do that some cons. It has very limited filters for narrowing down your results once you've done your search. There's also no subject searching, um, so the databases allow you to limit the subject um, as it has been categorized by someone on the back end, a librarian, a cataloger on the back end. So you can say, you know, I only want articles from this result that have been categorized as psychology articles. You can't do that in Google Scholar. Um, the content is pulled by robot crawlers of the internet, so it's not organized by experts. Sometimes there are duplicates. There's no easy way to identify which of the articles or resources are peer reviewed. Um, you would have to look up the publication itself and uh, find that out for yourself. And then sometimes the access that it provides you with, not through the library link, but the free access, I'll show you what the, the difference between them looks like. Sometimes it's to a pre-publication copy of the item. So that means that it's pulling it from an institutional repository and it's not the copy of record. It's not the copy of the article that was published in the journal. Um, it's usually something that hasn't been through a final edit. And so it might be slightly different than the publication copy. Um, and usually you can tell a pre-publication copy, it'll be stamped as pre-publication, or it'll look like a Microsoft Word document that has been turned into a PDF. Um, and so you want to be careful about citing the text of those. Um, I always think of pre-publication copies as being useful if it's the only way I can get to the article. Um, so I know what the content overall of the article will be as I wait for the publication copy of record through interlibrary loan, because that's what you want to cite uh, when you are doing research. Okay, so let's take a look at Google Scholar. All right, so a couple of things I wanna point out off the bat. Um, my Google Scholar homepage is being customized right now with recommended articles, including article an article written by some of my colleagues um, because I am logged in right here to my UNCG account. Um, and so if I were not logged in over here on the right, in fact, I'll sign out. Um, when you go to Google Scholar and I'll refresh, you'll have to sign in and you'll wanna sign in with your UNCG account so that you have access to the UNCG library. Okay, so I'm signed into my UNCG account. Um, when I do a search uh, for something, let's say 
information literacy instruction. Um, over here on the right, you'll see PDF from Semantic Scholar. So this is pulling from another source, not a publisher, um, but Semantic Scholar. I'm not actually even sure what that is. Let's find out. So it's actually pulling it through another similar search engine like Google Scholar. Um, so I'm not even sure, I guess they host PDFs too. So the, the sort of uh, copyright legality of some of these sources is not always completely evident. Um, PDF from seer.edu. Here we have uh, from another non-publisher source. Um, and so this looks like a best copy available. This looks like it is from Eric. Um, but so when you're pulling through the library link to UNCG resources, it'll say full, find full text at UNCG. And if you open this link, it'll actually link back to our library catalog and you'll click view full text and it'll go through a link resolver and bring you to the article. Um, if you don't have the library link established, you won't see this link here. Um, and to establish a library link to show you UNCG access. And sometimes you'll have duplicate access, right? You'll have a PDF from somewhere else and you'll have access through UNCG, but sometimes you'll only have access through a non-UNCG source. To set up the library link, you will want to go to the three parallel lines over here that indicates a menu, go to settings, which is the gear, and then click on library links. I already have my library link established, but you could search for UNCG, and it'll show you there are actually two library links, one for Gale, which is a single academic publisher of databases and books. Um, so they have a separate library link for Gale resources and then our general library link, find full text at UNCG. Once you have enabled these and you do your search, then you will start seeing these library links. Um, there are also some useful sort of tools for doing research. For example, if I found this article to be useful, I can use Google's related articles um, search here, which has no filters over here, um, to show you what the algorithm suggests may be related research. Again, we don't necessarily know how these algorithm works, algorithms work, but it's a additional tool for discovery, right? You're trying to figure out the lay of the land on this topic and it's suggesting you related articles. You can also find um, what Google has identified as all of the articles that have cited something, right? So, um, you know, these are all articles that have cited the article that I was just looking at, which is another way to pursue additional research. Um, when you use library databases, typically you are looking at the PDF of something um, and you go to the bibliography and you find all of these other additional sources and then you have to go find access to them. Whereas Google um, Scholar is saying, here are a bunch of other sources um, that are related to it. These have cited the, the original source. Um, over here on the left, you also see that you can set up a custom range. You only want articles past additional point or a specific point in time um, or only up until a specific point in time. Uh, there's also the citation tool, which creates a basic citation, um, which all of the databases through the library have as well. Um, some of these are not great, like this 59.6 is not how you indicate the volume and the issue in MLA 8th edition, um, so you want to be careful with just copying and pasting these into your works cited or reference page or bibliography, et cetera. You can also create an alert. Um, this is something that I find useful. So um, if you are doing instruction, I mean, if you are doing research on a topic um, and you do a search and you find a lot of good results, but you wanna know um, what new research is going to be published that would fall into that search, you can create an alert um, and Google will show you um, when they have uploaded or uh, indexed um, new articles that uh, would come up in that search. And um, if you look at your menu over here, if you have alerts set, you can actually see what your alerts are um, so that you can create an alert, monitor alerts, et cetera. Um, the other thing that I like about Google Scholar is that it's really easy to add things to a library by 
going to your results list and clicking save. Um, so this is a way to sort of manage um, your the research that you want to cite. Um, so here I've saved a bunch of articles. Um, and I like this because it's a single place where you can add things. So even if I found an article through another database, I might look it up in Google Scholar by searching for the title of it, find the Google Scholar citation, and then add it to this library so I can easily manage my um, research in one place. And then you can also click a bunch of boxes and export the citations all at once to EndNote um, using the BibTeX um, citation format, um, which will upload to um, other citation management. Again, this is something that you want to talk to with your subject librarian if you are interested in citation management. But you can also download it to a CSV, um, which is something that can be opened uh, in Excel or Google Sheets. So I'll show you what that looks like. Um, so once you're in Google Sheets, I'm going to, let's see, how do I upload? I might have to do it straight from Google Drive, actually. I'm um, going to upload a document, file upload. I'm going to find my new download. There we go, citations, open that. And then it'll create, um, that is not what I was looking for. There we go. Okay, it'll create a sheet with um, a spreadsheet of all of the articles and their citation information, the title, the publication, the volume, et cetera. Um, the other nice thing about Google Scholar that I like is that you can create an author profile. Um, so my profile here, so this is me, um, and this is an article that I uh, am a co-author on. Here is a uh, bibliography that I worked on. And then if this article were to be cited, I could see who was citing my work. Um, this was just published like three weeks ago, so uh, it is it is not, it has not been cited by anyone. Um, and this is also a way for people to follow your scholarship and if um, other researchers or scholars that you like are uh, sort of looking at your research, you can follow them here. Um, so lastly, I want to quickly uh, make a note, um, because I know that we're running out of time, about discovery and how it works. So through our library, we have the red search box, the discovery layer, um, and you can use that to search through multiple databases all at once. So MD means multidisciplinary database, subject database. These are generic here. Um, the Databases then have particular journal subscriptions associated with them. So some journals are only hooked up to particular databases, multidisciplinary databases, pull a bunch of different journals. And then you have the articles, which are the items associated with the journals. And I'm showing you here that we have the records for articles from some journals, but we don't necessarily have the access to the full text for all of the journals that we have um, indexed in our databases. In Google Scholar, what it is indexing is not through particular databases or uh, journals, but it's indexing the article. However, using Google Scholar, like I said, especially if you don't have the library link set up, you may not have access to it, which is what that dotted line is. Um, so you might be asking, what about the red search box on the library homepage? Um, I'm going to quickly uh, use an example. Um, so this is uh, one of my favorite artists, Lewis Wayne, um, who had schizophrenia and started creating progressively crazier um, images of cats. Um, so if we go to the library homepage and I'm searching for articles and I say cats and Lewis Wayne. You will see, um, I have nine results here and it's showing me that I, it's searching through all of these databases. Um, however, so the default that you, you need to know about um, this red search box is the default is that it is only searching through select databases by default. It's only searching through EBSCO and Gale databases. Um, and you, you know, as someone who doesn't work at the library, probably won't know which databases are EBSCO databases and which ones are Gale. But you should know that if you want it to search through all of our databases or specific databases using the search, you need to enable those databases. So for example, ProQuest Central is a giant database that is not, um, all right, 
did it before. So it, it moved up to this list, the giant database that um, is not part of the default search. So I can do that exact same search again, Katz and Lewis Wayne. And whereas I only had nine results before, now I have 234. Um, so when you use the red search box, unless you configure it to search multiple databases, you are not getting everything the library has access to. And that's not immediately clear um, because it just says millions of articles. Uh, Okay, so some closing thoughts. There's no single discovery school, uh, tool that finds everything, right? Because um, we don't have access to every article that has ever been written. Our databases don't index everything. Um, Google Scholar doesn't index everything. So a good research practice is to use a combination of multidisciplinary databases, subject databases, and Google Scholar. You always want to circle back to track down access to articles. You might find a citation, um, you know, in a Works Cited page or something. And so you want to circle back to these multiple sources to figure out what is going to give you access to the full text. Um, you can use alerts and manage your citations through our databases, through Google Scholar, through open access um, tools like Zotero. And your subject librarian is the person who can help you identify the best subject resources and use these advanced tools. So use us as a resource. Again, we are one of the most important library resources. Um, so lastly, I want to take any questions that anyone has, um, and my slide is sort of collapsing under here, but my email address is mmurphy at uncg.edu if you have any questions. And I have to figure out how to give Amy back the ball. Oh, I have the ball back. Thank you ever so much. No problem. All right, so does anybody, if you would like to um, unmute and ask a question, you are welcome to do so, or um, if you want to type in the chat box, you are also welcome to do that. If you have any questions for Maggie at this point. I'll go a little bit more than three seconds of dead <laughs> silence at this point, because maybe somebody's just working up to a really good question right now. Or not, I don't know, it's Friday. Um, yeah, maybe. no, that's cool. I, I mean, felt like you covered it very well. I learned a lot, so. Oh, well, great. And again, the moral of the story is if you need help using any of these things or finding out more about them, librarians are the best place to go. All right, well, thank you so much, Maggie. And um, everyone, thank you for being here. Many of you are, um, are veterans of the webinar series at this point. So please look um, in your email for information about the spring webinars. And um, we hope that you enjoyed this one and that you join us again next semester. So thank you for coming today.